Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome back to the Life Alerts Podcast. Hope you all are doing well today. Watch auctions were in full swing this past weekend in Geneva. This season, I think the condition was really at the forefront of the minds of the auction, auction houses. I really enjoyed the wide selection of watches um, that sold. Um, and, and some fairly significant lots as well, but I really think that, that the auction houses focused on condition um, this last weekend in Geneva. I think it also really, you know, gets you excited uh, for the next auction, which is going to be in Hong Kong coming up, so things to look forward to. But what I thought I would do is talk through some of the lots that I thought were quite interesting at each of the auction houses. Um, and I'll put links in the show notes to this, in this uh, podcast so you can kind of follow along. So the first one I wanted to talk about, and it obviously was in the title of this uh, of this podcast, is uh, the um, from the Rare Watches auction at Christie's, which was lot eighty four. It was um, the Patek Philippe Nautilus for Tiffany Blue Dial fifty seven eleven. Obviously, the the first Tiffany Blue. I'll try to keep this short because I think everyone's spoken about this, these watches. But the first one sold for three point two million. Um, the watch that sold at, at uh, Christie's sold for uh, 2.2 million. So you could say that this was on sale, um, but uh, it's pretty interesting that um, one of these showed up at auction. I'm sure that the owner of it was probably spoken to pretty pretty drastically um, by uh, by Patek Philippe um, for, for selling it. And I'm sure that's gonna be quite difficult for them to get, a, get their watch, but a decent payday for them, uh, two point two million Swiss francs versus um, the probably you know fifty seven thousand I think it was at uh, at retail. Sticking with the Christie's, um, the Christie's rare watches auction, um, I wanted to talk through a watch that I've mentioned in a previous podcast, which was the Jaeger Coultre um, stainless steel triple calendar watch with moon phase and a beautiful black dial from the nineteen from nineteen fifty. I thought this was an extremely rare and really attractive um, version of this watch. I'm a huge fan of these. I, I think I've had a couple of them in the uh, over the past in, in my you know over the past uh, couple of years. Um, the estimate was eight to twelve thousand. This thing sold for twenty one thousand five by four hundred and twenty Swiss francs. Um, I think again. I think this was really a good indication of what condition, how important condition was during this last auction. If you look at the dial, the dial is like basically untouched. And I think it's confirmed by, by, um, by uh, Christie's that it, it's an untouched original black dial, which is um, incredibly beautiful. Um, the the hands match the the, the beautiful um, beautifully loomed um, hour markers, with, which are um, numbers instead of numerals or indicator, just like you know indicators. So a really really cool cool lot, and I was really excited that it that it sold for above the estimate. Um, um, and I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. There's a Patek Philippe um, lighter that sold. Um, 9508 was the reference from the 1980s. Um, if you follow collectability, I, I highly recommend if you're interested in Patek Philippe, you follow collectability because they have such a wealth of knowledge. Um, John Reardon does an incredible job over there. Um, but they recently spoke about lighters um, on, on, on their website and they've sold a couple in the past. Um, this is an incredibly beautiful 18 karat gold and enamel, uh, green enamel uh, lighter um, from the 1980s, as I mentioned. Um, these things are just such cool, um, cool gadgets, and I think they're becoming more significant as time sort of goes on. People want to uh, want to own these kind of cool gadgets. I think MBNF actually does a really nice job of balancing the Mad Gallery in these. Um, the estimate was twelve to eighteen thousand Swiss francs. It sold for just shy of fifty-three thousand. Um, obviously, I think that's with buyer's premium. So, shifting gears a little bit, I'm going to move on to Anticorum. I think the the big lot that was spoken about was lot four fifty, which was the the reference twelve fifty two chameleon in yellow gold. Um, this is one of two known. The other one being in the Patek Philippe Museum. Um, Estimate was fifty to one hundred thousand Swiss francs. It sold for three hundred eighty-seven thousand five hundred Swiss francs. I'm not gonna lie. I was hoping for half a million. Um, I think it's a, a significant enough watch that, for it to sell at that price. But this is an incredible achievement for this watch. Um, it also is an incredible achievement for the Patek Philippe at auction. So, congrats um, to the buyer. Congrats to the Anticorum. It really is a cool lot. Um, we'll have to see if any of these turn up after this last result. 
um, or excuse me, after after this result, um, if anyone's maybe got one of these chameleons hiding away in uh, in their collections. I mentioned this watch in, in one of these previous um, auction um, auction previews, but um, there was a and I've mentioned this section on our Instagram as well. That there was a reference E eight five seven memo box deep sea, um, which. Uh, I had spoken to about on Instagram as a sort of, you have to appreciate the condition of this watch. It definitely is in all original condition, but the bezel is not in untouched condition, which might deter some collectors. Um, it sold for 30,000 Swiss francs, which was the top estimate between 20 and 30 was the estimate. I do think this probably went to a collector who appreciates this type of condition, the all originality and the sort of life that it's lived is um, definitely apparent with this one. I know I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that condition was at the forefront. I do think it goes the entire spectrum, both condition in all originality, but also in really high quality originality. Sticking with Antiquorum, there was a reference 570 with a black dial that sold for 131,000, which was um, well above the 50 to 80,000 Swiss franc estimate. Black dial, Calatravas are very difficult this was confirmed by the by the um, by the archives, um, and was uh, was in really good condition for something that's sold in nineteen forty one, especially with a black dial. Um, this came from Germany, which also was kind of cool to to think about what was going on in nineteen forty one. There was also an incredibly beautiful, and this was all over Instagram, um, an incredibly beautiful pink gold um, in 1463 with pink um, gold dial. It was quite interesting that this didn't sell for much more than I, than, than what it did. Um, 1463s are really um, are really popular. The estimate was 250 to 450,000 Swiss francs. It only sold for 325. The only thing I can think of is perhaps the condition wasn't in, wasn't, uh, wasn't perfect. Um, the hallmarks looked pretty pretty good on the sides of the case. The only thing I can think of is maybe the lugs look a little bit, um, or at least the top of the lugs look a little bit um, soft, but I, I couldn't imagine that this that would deter someone from really, um, really going in. Maybe the market for 1463 pink on pinks are just a little bit softer. Um, it is a beautiful watch, and I'm definitely very jealous of the new owner. Um, another watch that I think was a sort of hallmark for the um, for Philips was um, the Arma PG Yellow Gold chronograph with full calendar and moon phase reference 831. I mentioned this on my Instagram, but I do think it's one of the most significant watches to sell. It's hard to get vintage Arma PG. It's hard to get complicated vintage Arma PG. Um, the estimate was 150 to 300 thousand. This went for well above. At seven hundred thirty-six thousand six hundred, I think that is with buyer's premium. Um, again, I think I, for me, I think this shows the significance of Armand, vintage Armand Piguet to the market. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some other things pop up now that this sort of achieved this sort of result. Um, I think maybe in the next year or two, we could see a trend towards these. What's even crazier is this watch was only thirty-three millimeters in diameter. A lot of the vintage watch collectors said of. Sort of you know shy away from these sizes because they don't really fit on them in the modern modern market but for me this would be a perfectly sized watch for my wrist sticking with Philips um, lot three was a Cartier pebble this was number 71 of 150 pieces that were manufactured in 2023 it sold for 106,680 estimate was 30 to 60,000 um, I think this was, um, there were a lot of questions I think going into the year of whether or not vintage Cartier or watches of these smaller sizes um, would really um, continue to be popular. But I do think this shows the resilience of, of um, that sort of trend. I think you, I have been seeing some collectors wearing small dressy uh, PHA watches. Um, and I think this is a nice sort of um, example of how this uh, could probably be um, 
could probably um, be a trend that will continue over the next uh, next year. Another watch that I have spoken about is um, the uh, Pliguet um, dive watch with a big light bezel and date that was in absolutely incredible condition, something that I, I haven't seen this type of condition on this watch um, for a very long time. It's estimated to go between 40 and 80,000 Swiss francs, went for 120,000 Swiss francs. Um, I was expecting more, if I'm completely honest. These are really, really rare. I think it's known that there's something like 10 of these that were ever produced, um, or a very small amount of these that were ever produced. Um, there was another example that sold for 131,000 Swiss francs in 2018. Um, excuse me, I found it here. Less than 60 examples of this were, were made. Um, it went for around the same as what it went for. The other example went for in 2018. And for some reason, I just thought it was going to go for more because I do think the condition on this one was even better. Um, so maybe a soft result for, for vintage divers. One of the watches that sold for, I want to say, one of the highest prices this, this uh, past weekend was a Rolex reference 6270, which was um, really, really rare in yellow gold uh, chronograph. It's a cosmograph with diamond puff A dial, sapphire indices, uh, brigade diamond set bezel, and uh, it still had the original case back on it. It was also phenomenal, well, basically original with a condition that really was, really was not worn. There was super sharp bevels with um, a little bit of oxidation on the, on the um, gold um, bracelet, yellow gold bracelet. Um, it sold for a whopping 3.69 million Swiss francs, estimated was 1.2, 2.4 million Swiss francs. Um, this is huge, and I think it shows the, the desire to have to collect maybe some oddball uh, chronograph, Rolex chronographs. Um, so, still a lot of resilience, I think, for, uh, for those. One of the lots that I think was probably one of the headliners was um, the Biver. A unique titanium cardinal Venera Peter Turbion wristwatch that was a prototype with an obsidian dial. Um, obviously, Biver, Jean Claude Biver and his son launched, um, launched their brand. Um, I think there were mixed opinions on these. I think this definitely showed a lot of watchmaking prowess, which is impressive and I think describes Jean Claude Biver and his son, sort of their vision for the company. Um, but some people say, you know, <laughs> another turbial minute repeater is, or another turbial minute repeater is, um, it's, uh, definitely, definitely something, uh, there's a lot of them out there and, uh, don't know if the watch world really needs another one. I don't know where I fall, I do think it's a really beautiful watch regardless, and I think they've, they've presented it in a really nice way, and, um, I think it is a, definitely a powerhouse for one of their first watches that they've ever produced. I would definitely love wearing it. Um, what was interesting is um, this was sold by Philips and um, the estimate was actually on request so they didn't actually give a band for these. I think the, the production ones that they're selling were something around 500,000 Swiss francs. This one sold for 1.27 million Swiss francs, so well above what um, what the uh, um, what the estimate was. Um, if you flip, flip the watch over, you can see that the movement is signed prototype one. And then at the bottom it says prototype pour JCB. So this was a watch that was made for Jean Claude Biver and was um, sold. Um, it's a whoever owns it now. I think is definitely um, you know I, I'll read from Phillips. He said the present watch will also be unique in its configuration as will be the only Biver watch in titanium with silver obsidian dial. Never again will this configuration be used for anyone else other than the owners of this piece. He or she has the option of commissioning his or her next Biver pieces in the titanium and obsidian. As such, as such, these watches will remain unique. So basically, what you're buying here is the opportunity to have this configuration on all your other Biver watches, which I think is a pretty cool um, thing that was purchased. So the watch collector probably has a nice little in with the brand here. Um, I'm moving on to Sotheby's. Uh, Sotheby's had a really cool reference 96 from 1979. Uh, I know the reference 96 is um, is uh, is a person. You have to have a personal taste to really um, to really like these um, these watches. They are a little bit smaller, so 
maybe they won't really fit your um, fit your wrist. Um, but this watch was in pretty cool condition. So I'm a huge fan of when gold oxidizes. I think it gives watches a very unique look to themselves. Um, this one was super oxidized around the outside of the watch, on the on the lugs, um, on the case uh, sides of the case. The condition of this was overall really really strong. Um, estimate six to eight million, six to eight million. That'd be cool for a rifle ninety six. No, six to eight thousand um, Swiss francs. It sold for seventeen point seventeen thousand seven hundred eighty Swiss francs. I think it showed that this was what I was speaking about when it came to condition. Perfect example of how unique condition like this will attract buyers and it attracted me i, I love um i love oxidation on cases because i do think it makes the watch just a little bit more unique the last watch i wanted to talk about was also also in sotheby's it was a vintage uh, patek philippe uh, they described as a rectangular shape number 10 yellow gold watch from 1907 this has a rectangular case with a really beautiful clean tile um, these watches, I think, have become um, somewhat desirable as people sort of move um, uh, move towards um, towards owning watches that are a little bit more dressy, a little bit um, a little bit uh, a little bit um, a little bit more classic and smaller in size. Um, the, the movement was actually double signed J.B. Hudson and, and Sons, which was a retailer that um, that sold this watch. Um, the watch was, however, um, restored. The dial had been uh, refinished, and the hands and numerals no longer had radium on them. So you were getting um, th this does have a restored dial, but at the same time, a really beautiful looking watch um, and incredible case um, to say the least. If you flip the watch over, it's um, it actually has an engraving on it which is, says Jubin uh, Steeds Avery Jr. in Mason City, uh, Iowa, January 12th, 1922. So a pretty cool piece of history there. Sold for 68,000, estimated between 68,000, sold for 10,000. Um, this is obviously not maybe on their all original condition that I mentioned before, but still a really strong result for something that did have um, some, some finishing on it. I wanted to end on this piece because maybe this is an indicator that um, that uh, the definition for condition and what collectors are desiring may be changing. Maybe we are sort of opening up to the idea that if you get something restored and it's done well and tries to bring it back to its all original condition or to its original condition or original um, design intent, you might end up with something that um, that can still be valued by collectors and. Um, can be an important part of someone's uh, personal collection. So who knows? We'll have to see if that if that sticks, but um, some really cool, some cool lots. So if I kind of summarized, I think there were some significant watches like the 1252 uh, Chameleon from Patek Philippe. You had a pretty cool, um, it's a pretty cool sort of unique looking watches like the full calendar corner F on our PGA or the, the Brigade um, dive watch with the Bakelite bezel that was in really great condition. Um, condition varied across all these watches, but it was a re refinished dial like that, um, that rectangular Patek Philippe. Or if you were looking at something like the, um, even the Quilter Triple Calendar with black dial, um, that's all that, uh, at Christie's. Originality, um, can, so condition varied. Originality, um, could be interpreted in many different ways. And I think it's showing that people are open to, to all these different, um, all these different ways of collecting. So let me know what your favorite lot was from the auction. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, hit us up on Instagram. Um, you can also follow us there. We post there uh, pretty often. So if you want to get some more um, watch content from me, um, you can head over to Life from the Rest uh, on Instagram. Check out our website for some articles and videos on, YouTube on our YouTube channel if you want to see those as well. If you want to look to the podcast, be sure you follow us and share this with a friend who might be interested in watches. And if you wouldn't mind me reading this podcast, read us, help me out. With this, guys, thank you so much for listening to this podcast, and until next time.